Start. Oh my god. Oh my god. I, I don't even know where to start. What, what, what do I even... I, I, do you know what I've been doing for the past two weeks? Do you know what I've been doing instead of making videos? Well, you do now! This game has been eating my free time alive. And I love it. All right, all right. Deep breath. Get the jitters out. Slow the hype train. <coughs> Salt and Sacrifice is the much-anticipated brainchild of Devoured Studios, previously known as Ska Studios. It takes place in the same universe as its predecessor, Salt and Sanctuary, and has players taking on the role of being an Inquisitor, a mage hunter of sorts whose only goal in life is to hunt and destroy magical beings causing problems for the realm. Level up your character, use an assortment of weapons, armors, and skills, and hunt down a wide arrangement of mages and rid the realm of their corruption once and for all. And for some of you, that's all you need to know. This game is more than happy to point you in the direction of the bosses and turn you loose, foaming at the mouth and stabbing wildly. But if you're interested in the lore and story of this world, I have good news. It's fantastic. The writing is exactly what you'd expect from the Salt series, providing narratively interesting dialogue and descriptions that keep you asking questions and constantly drive you forward. We've all sorts of new places to explore and people to meet, all of which have an expanded dialogue system now, so you can dive as much or as little into the lore as you want. And if you're really wanting to dive deep, there's item descriptions, an entire skill tree to read through, and the bosses themselves offer different dialogue options as well. So yeah, plenty of reading to do if you want it. And like I said before, it's good reading. I'll admit it felt pretty black and white at first. Kill mages, get a little dialogue, kill more mages, get some more dialogue, you know, nothing mind-blowing. But then the mages started asking questions. Then I started asking questions. And then everything I thought I knew started to change, and my worldview got flipped upside down, and then there was a part of the story that shook me so goddamn much that I literally screamed in shock at my screen when it happened. So, uh, yeah. Good stuff. Highly recommend the ride. For those of you wondering what kind of game you're about to embark on, it's been described as a 2D Dark Souls Monster Hunter combo, which I would agree with, in most respects. The gameplay loop is simple enough. You'll start in Partner's Vale, your headquarters and main hub, where you'll upgrade your weapons, improve your inventory limits, and interact with any NPCs you've found throughout the game. Once you feel ready, though, you'll use the portal to head into Worlds Unknown, where mages and other dangers lie in wait. Unlike Monster Hunter, this game is more about exploration and less about hunting the monster of the week. You'll explore huge maps, sprawling in all directions, finding yourself in all manners of environments, from caves to deserts to snow-covered peaks. And throughout these maps, you'll find clues, detailing the whereabouts of mages that you, as an Inquisitor, must destroy. Follow the clues, and you'll surely find your quarry. Unlike Salt and Sanctuary, however, a majority of the bosses in this game are found in somewhat random locations, wandering throughout the map and interacting with other enemies in the game. Do enough damage to a mage, and it'll begin to run towards its lair, spawning enemies and wild attacks in an effort to fend you off until it can recover. Keep up the hunt, and eventually you'll corner your prey where you'll engage in battles that put the original Salt and Sanctuary bosses to shame. All along the way, you'll be collecting materials and enemy drops, some of which are specific to the boss and its minions. When you head back to Pardoner's Vale, be sure to visit the blacksmith. Giving him these materials will allow you to make all sorts of useful equipment, whether it's new armor that helps you bolster your elemental defenses, weapons that play against a mage's weakness, or charms and rings that boost your stats and abilities. Speaking of abilities, there's a lot of them. Every weapon comes with a special weapon art, some more than others, which really helps make every weapon feel unique. This isn't a case of choosing between a mace that does physical damage and a mace that does water damage. We're talking differences like one can heal you on the fly, while another casts magical bubbles that knock all of your opponents around the screen. And if you're the kind of person that just likes raw power, there's still weapons that don't have any special abilities at all, aside from heavy damage. That's always been the beauty of the Salt series. Play around enough with all the tools at your disposal, and you'll find your build. Guaranteed. Speaking of builds, things are much the same as before. Using the salt you collect from defeating enemies, you can level up your character and use the skill tree to build your character just the way you want to. The silver you find from looting enemies will also come in handy, allowing you to purchase items from vendors, like ammunition, basic weapons and armor, and the all-important firebombs. You'll also collect artifacts from around the map and from every mage you kill. These artifacts are randomly generated, but can be upgraded and improved with a specific NPC. Finding a good artifact may change the entire way you play, so keep on the lookout for one that boosts your playstyle. Personally, I was a big fan of artifacts that increased my alchemy damage, silver drop rates, and stamina regen speed, but that's literally just the tip of the iceberg. And again, much like other aspects of the game, if you don't want to engage with the system all that much, you really don't have to. 
I was able to play through the game without doing too much micromanagement or grinding, just using the best artifacts I found naturally and changing them up whenever I found myself struggling with a specific situation. So for those of you who want to build the best possible character, you've got the option. But for anyone who just wants to have a simple good time and experience the game, you might have a slightly more uphill challenge on your hands, but nothing that I would ever deem unfair by any means. In regards to the difficulty, this game has been an absolute blast. The introductory curve felt very fair, and new players should be able to get into the action with very few brick walls or headaches. For players such as myself who have been playing the Salt series for years and, if I may be so humble, have a mastery of the controls and systems, chances are you'll find the game pretty easy. At first. Difficulty ramps up slowly, with each new boss bringing fresh challenges to the table, so that you can never get truly comfortable. There's no one-size-kills-all build like there was in the first game. Weep along with me, fellow Jaws of Death users, for our god has abandoned us. But honestly, I'm glad this is the case. A game gets boring if the answer to every problem is just spamming the heavy attack button. Try that in Salt and Sacrifice, and you'll get plastered across the floor pretty quick. To be clear, Salt and Sacrifice never felt unfair. There were plenty of bosses I had to throw myself against several times, but once I started paying attention to why I was losing, I was able to adjust my strategy and beat them on the next few tries. But you know that feeling you got when you played Salt and Sanctuary or Dark Souls for the first time? That feeling of running into an insurmountable challenge, one you thought impossible just for everything to suddenly click? Yeah. You're gonna get that again. And you're gonna love it when it happens. And if for some reason you find yourself struggling with a particular boss, good news! Jolly cooperation is at hand and it works beautifully. Connections are quick, interactions are smooth, and running around screaming as you get absolutely annihilated by mages is some of the most fun I've had this year in video games. Enemies will scale, depending on how many friends you bring along, so you won't be able to completely goon squad your way through the game. But it never felt like the game was trying to overcompensate, and having a partner to help distract a boss while I healed was its own blessing. Though don't let that go to your head. Bosses can absolutely handle multiple players. Unlike other games, where certain bosses fall to pieces when they have to focus on several targets at once, Salt and Sacrifice's mages have plenty of attacks and animations that will make everyone in the arena scramble for cover. It's fair, it's fun, and I highly recommend everyone try it at least once. On the other side of the coin, invasions are absolutely a thing and are just as fun and hectic as you'd expect. Every faction brings something new to the table. Some invaders will just try to murder you, others will send minions of their own to chase you down, and still others will give you boxes of loot or, uh, worms. Just like the cooperative multiplayer, I'm glad to report that there was minimal lagging or warping around when invading or being invaded, and that chasing each other around the map felt fluid and fun. I'm usually not a fan of PvP, but Salt has found a sweet spot that hits me just right, and I'll definitely be making sure invasions are possible throughout my entire next playthrough. If you're not a fan of online interaction though, don't worry. Adding a password to your game will keep those pesky invaders away, while still allowing you to summon a friend through online or couch co-op. And for those of us who hunt achievements, you'll be happy to know there's no achievement for any form of online interaction, so solo players will still be able to proudly display a 100% clear rate with the rest of the community. Honestly, I could go on and on about the different systems and possibilities of this game. I haven't even mentioned the crafting system, the different Inquisitor tools you'll be finding to help you navigate through the world, the fact that there's daily mage hunts that repopulate each day for your hunting pleasure, or the fact that you can pet your favorite elk or deer cat. It... there's a lot. And it's all good. It's also wonderfully, beautifully good. They nailed it. Moving on. Alright, alright, you twisted my arm, I'll gush about it. First, let's talk about the most obvious change from the first game. The art style. It's definitely a bit different than the salt we used to know, and I have a feeling that's going to turn a few people away from the game if they simply judge the look by its cover. You'd be a fool if you did, though. Salt and Sacrifice was definitely made by James Silva. The game may look a bit brighter, but the boss designs, enemies, and levels all have that unique salt feel, being both beautiful and monstrous at the same time. Personally, the new style grew on me rather quickly, as the new artwork makes it much easier to tell what's going on around you. Absolutely essential when you've got enemies and invaders coming at you from all sides. If you're worried that James has gone soft and the dark horror aesthetic is gone, you, uh, you might want to rethink that one. One thing that has changed quite a bit is the music. This go around, the music was created by McLean Deemer. Some of you might recognize him as the creator of the music for Guild Wars 2. Initially, I was a tad worried. Though it's extremely beautiful, Guild Wars 2's score definitely doesn't fit the Salt universe very well, so I was initially concerned that we'd get some clashing tones between the game and its music. Holy shit was I wrong. I've been playing some of Salt and Sacrifice's music throughout this entire video as penance, but I want to make sure it's written on the internet with ink. McLean, you goddamn nailed it, and I apologize for ever doubting you. 
Seriously, this music has been stuck in my head for days, and it's gotten to the point that I went out of my way to record the music for my own listening pleasure so I don't go mad waiting for the soundtrack to come out. I mean, come on, listen to this. The warbling, the tension, the intensity, it's that same mixture of beauty and ugliness that you get from James's art style made audible. And you literally can't ask for more than that. Alright, so, you're excited about the game, but how can you play it? Well, things haven't changed there. Salt and Sacrifice will be releasing on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, and PC on the Epic Games Store. Personally, I've played it on PC and PlayStation 4, and they both feel the exact same. So go ahead, choose the console of your choice. You have nothing to lose, and everything to gain. No information on whether or not Salt and Sacrifice will be coming to other platforms in the future, but I wouldn't be surprised if that changes down the line. If I've managed to convert any of you that were on the fence about getting the game on launch, here's the final shove. It's coming out tomorrow, May 10th, and it'll only cost you a whopping $20. $20! That's insane for the amount of content you're getting. It took me a little over 21 hours to get through my first playthrough, and that was without doing any grinding or multiplayer interaction. I also apparently missed out on some optional bosses and areas, so that number isn't even accurate if you want to experience everything this game has to offer. Salt and Sacrifice is the perfect game for someone like myself. It's got lots of hidden lore that doesn't force you to interact with it if you don't want to, a huge number of fair but frantic boss fights that test your skills, and a world that doesn't force a particular playstyle on its players, allowing them to create the character and gameplay experience they want. It's fun, it's exciting, and it's a fantastic game all the way around.